Hello there, and welcome to another episode of... <coughs> you from the Geldy. Right, hopefully there's been some suitably sinister music playing in the intro. Um, probably from the Hellraiser soundtrack, because I bloody love it. Because we are going to be dealing with a fairly sinister book today. It's Jack Fan Fanny. Jack Finney's The Body Snatchers. Now, this is part of the Masterwork series, a long-running science fiction collection of classics from the last 60-odd years. Um, and I, I always buy these books because you discover gems that you may never have heard of before. So I'd never heard of Jack Finney, although, of course, I had heard of The Body Snatchers from the films. And, of course, the idea of parasitic alien intelligence is... Uh, Invading human hosts is nothing new to us in this modern age. It's been prevalent in popular culture ever since this book came out. Perhaps before, I don't know. Uh, one thing springs to mind is The Wrath of Khan, the second Star Trek film, whereby Khan the devious bugger puts this little alien maggot thing in Chekhov's ear, one of another chap as well, and thereby takes over his mind. So we're all familiar with the concept, even if we've never read the book. But I thought I would read the book to see what it was like. And I was quite impressed. So this was written in 1955. Um, but the book is set in 1953, only two years before. Um, and so it's definitely coloured by that era, 50s America. It is set in a small provincial town um, in California. Um, and this horrible situation plays out in that kind of quite small community of people. The, to the story is told through a GP, um, a Dr. Miles Bennell. And one evening at the end of his uh, shift, um, an old friend comes to pay a visit um, an old girlfriend, in fact, from high school, um, Becky Triscoll. And she's got, she's quite embarrassed to talk about this, but she's talking about her cousin who, who doesn't believe that her father is her father anymore. Talks like him, has the same mannerisms, looks exactly the same, but there's something about him that's not quite right. So she asks if he wouldn't mind coming to have a chat with this man, because the doctor knows everyone in the town. So he does so, and doesn't notice any difference. And so there's a lot of doubting going on um, about whether anything's going on at all. But as the book unfolds, there's more and more reason to be uh, concerned. No less than the the giant fucking alien eggs that they <laughs> start finding in, in basements of houses. So what's going on is that these these eggs end up normally hidden somewhere in the basement or in a cupboard. And when the, the occupant of the house goes to sleep, this egg starts forming them. A facsimile of the person asleep. And so that by the end of the night, the, the sleeping human has withered away into nothing. But downstairs in the basement, there's a perfect copy of that person, all the way up to the memories they possess. And so the thing that lack, they lack is emotion. They're, they're kind of parodying emotion. They're pretending that they have emotion. And that's where close relatives are able to spot the difference really uh, creepy um, situation. Even now, even though I'm very well familiar with this idea, reading it um, certainly uh, tweaked my nipples slightly, shall we say. Um, I'm just going to read a little tiny passage that's particularly unsettling. So at this point of the story, I'm only going to read a paragraph, but it, it, it sums it up in a nutshell. Um, the doctor, the good doctor and uh, Becky and another couple um, who are investigating the situation, they panic the night before and they just flee the town. 
and stay overnight in a motel. The next morning, in the cold light of day, they think maybe we overreacted, so they come back to the town. Anyway, they end up at the residence of the the uncle that um, he was investigating at the very beginning and saw no nothing untoward. And they end up lingering outside the window and they eavesdrop on a conversation between the family members. All appears normal, normal conversation until they start talking about the fact that they know that the doctor and Becky have come back to town. There's no reason why they should know. But of course, there's some kind of alien grapevine going on and they're talking about them. But in a very uh, sinister uh, and mocking way. And once the conversation's finished, this is what he observes. Then they all laughed soundlessly, their lips pulled back from their teeth, their eyes amused, mocking and utterly cold. And I knew these weren't Wilma, Uncle Ira, Aunt Aleda or Becky's father. Knew they were not human beings at all. And I was very nearly sick. So... Yeah, that idea of these uh, possessed uh, humans, uh, well, they're actually aliens now, but kind of trying to laugh, but no sound coming out in there. <laughs> like this, I suppose. Very disturbing imagery. <coughs> okay, so no spoilers. I'm not going to tell you how it ends. Um, but I'm going to talk about some of the things that I... I think maybe didn't work so well or are revealed to be slightly, well, it's of its time in terms of a modern reading, things that kind of stick out. So the first thing that I've read, I've read this before in the past, that the the idea that this book is or was inspired by the, the fear of communism during the 1950s in America, during the, the Cold War, everyday Americans were worried about the influx or the, the infection of communism. And of, of course, ideas passing between people wouldn't be necessarily easy to spot. Um, they would look the same, talk the same and all of that. But the ideas floating around in people's heads may not be the same as them. So it's very easy to draw that parallel. But whether or not that's the case, the thing I don't like about critics when they try to uh, deconstruct works of science fiction and fantasy in, in particular is that the way they tend to try to give justification or um, I don't know literary um, something or other I can't <laughs> I don't know the word but is by trying to contextualize it in terms of its political, social, economic, whatever. So the it's not enough for it to be a story of fantasy or of science fiction. It has to mean something in the time in which it was written. I don't like that. I don't think it needs to do that. And it doesn't elevate a work if it has some kind of bearing on when it was written. I don't really care about that. That's my personal opinion. Um, the other thing I was just going to say was that... Um, this this book also reminded me of a dream I once had 20 years ago. Um, and I've always remembered it. And it was when I was living in Japan. And I had a dream that another war had started between the West and Japan. And I thought, I kind of felt, even when I was living there, that I was almost like Japanese. Because I, all I ever saw were ever Japanese. There's no one... Um, around me uh, from from the west and then I thought I feel like I'm them but I obviously I, I look different so they're all going to as soon as I step out the door they're going to know it's me so it's it, was, it reminded me of later in the book when more and more people are infected by this um, alien consciousness um, but anyway there we are um, okay so let's get back to the time in which it was written this is in the 50s so there's lots of scenes where they're smoking um almost every time um they gather together to have a conversation cigarettes are passed around and they're smoking their heads off um 
I quite like that as, as an ex-smoker. I, I love reading about smoking, but it does stick out. It's like watching 70s or 80s television where there's always a fag in someone's hand. It's, yeah, it's just a, a quirk of the time, I suppose. Um, the other thing is the dubious gender politics going on. This is nothing um, surprising here. You encounter the same kind of thing. I'm just recalling from... Um, John Wyndham's uh, David Triffids and uh, Midwich Cuckoos, same kind of things going on. The people who save the day, the heroes of the hour, are always men. They tend to be, and not just normal every, everyday men, they tend to be academics or landed gentry or doctors, professors, that kind of thing. And the same, same holds true here. A lot of the information is imparted by, well, we've got a writer, we've got a GP and a professor, same kind of thing. Whilst the women tend to be simpering, cowering um, presences, slightest little thing goes wrong and they're more or less passing out, um, leaving only the courageous doctor to smack them back into uh, consciousness. Not literally, but I think he pinches uh, Becky at one point, which I thought was a bit odd. Um, so yes, there, there is that. Um, that always sticks out like a sore thumb in these older books. But obviously you just read it within the context in which it was written. It may annoy some people, but I, I don't. I just It's just amusing in a way because things have changed quite drastically. Um, another thing that was odd was um, this. at times analogies are used to describe the more obscure things that are going on, especially to a readership from the 1950s. I mean, now we're well versed in many different ideas, whether it's in science or in speculative science fiction. We understand a lot more, but then maybe not so. So analogies are used um, and they stick out quite um, acutely at times as being quite odd. So they they see one of these eggs halfway through maturing and so it has a, a, a human shape but with no features only later do the finer details emerge and one of i think the wife of this other couple the bella sex or the bella checks I, I don't know what they're called um she says it reminds her of when they were i think it was on their honeymoon <laughs> they went to see how medallions were made um and so there, there were two pressings, the initial pressing to get the general shape of the medallion and then a second pressing for the finer details. Now, unless in the 50s um, medallion manufacturer, um, if ma manufacturing was all the rage, perhaps that would make sense, but um, just seemed very odd. I mean, the analogy works very well, um, at least in, t in, in process, but um, yeah, I don't imagine you'd go to see that on your honeymoon unless you're very odd indeed. Um, one other thing that stuck out to me, and this is something I, I really enjoy from uh, historical science fiction, is is the science involved. So obviously, if you go back to the 50s, what they knew about science, um, about astronomy, all kinds of things, physics, wouldn't be the same as now. And so it can be quite interesting to see what they believed or what they understood at that time. Now, one of the things was um, this is speculative. The the alien actually, the alien intelligence ends up saying at, at a certain point through a human host that at one time the moon was alive and it was a place where life thrived, but <laughs> through the actions of these aliens, all of the life disappeared. Now, um, I don't believe that even in the fifties they ever considered the fact that the moon was ever in a state of life perhaps it was well, that's quite an interesting thing the other thing was the the idea that these so these eggs arrive to earth this is a slight spoiler but it's, it's nothing arrive to earth through the hard vacuum of space which is plausible i suppose and they're conveyed conveyed by light pressure which is certainly a thing a thing that may be exploited in the future using light sails there's a there's a pressure or a a force of, that that light exerts on on objects it's very small but the cumulative effect is you know it can be quite um pronounced but it's just a little thing really i mean the professor said that that light has a weight and that the cumulative effect of blah 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 but of course light doesn't have weight um it is massless it's just um energy um and, uh, inertia 
Um, so whether that's um, a mistake or whether it's just what they believed then, I don't know. But anyway, it just stuck in my mind and I thought I'd talk about it. <clears throat> okay, so the, the last thing is the, it's the kind of... Because it's set in a small town, there's a kind of a provincial um, scope to the book. So I suppose because we we now live with the internet and we understand um, far more and we understand repercussions that exist beyond a, a small scale, um, the ideas proposed in this book seem quite small scale or quite quaint almost. The idea that the these aliens, whilst they're able to fully replicate anything around them um, in this egg way, um, they're still only able to spread their growing population in the most rudimentary way. Um, carrying these eggs around in their hands or sticking them in, in cars to be later deposited in people's basements. That seemed um, slightly, um, yeah, a little silly in a way, but there we are. Just being a bastard, aren't I? Anyway, um, I've rambled along enough. Yeah, sorry, it's always too long. Um, thanks for watching. Um, if you've watched, you're not going to have watched this far, but if you have, um, let me know if you've read the book before. Also, let me know why you even bothered watching me talk about it. Um, these were interesting things to me. I'm just doing these book reviews just because, well, it's something to put on here, isn't it? I like talking about books and I like reading. I like to hear what other people think about books I've read as well. But these are all my own opinions. I don't research. Once I've finished a book, I don't research it and see what other people think. It's just my own impression. Um, so, yeah, take, take that with a pinch of salt. Um, right, I better go now. Thanks for watching and uh, see you next time. Cheerio. It's from the gelding. That was crap. I don't want to read all of it because it's just some of it just gets in the way, but this will give you an idea. Okay. So, fuck. This one is part of the Masterwork series, um, which is a a series of uh, books. They fuck you, but it would be quite fitting because I'm going to be talking today about Jack Finney. Fuck. Jack Finney's The Body Snatchers. What is the matter with you, mate? Anyway, um, yeah, I just, I, I often like these older books. Um, hey, John, what are you doing? You're being a tit. Doesn't, I tell you what, fucking crap, mate. Crap. But there's also a kind of inhuman look about him even though you know he look he appears human um but isn't uh there we are um fucking hell john are you stroking out mate fuck um so right um oh man i tell you what i am no good at this No fucking good. We're probably all familiar with the idea behind this. Um, cunt. What is the matter, you fucking bastard? I'm never going to do this. Never. Ever. Oh, hello. Welcome. Uh, today, fuck. I'm going to fuck up. I'm going to fuck up every fucking time I fucking do it. The Khan puts a little worm into Chekhov's ear and controls his mind thereafter. Um, there was another fucking reference and I can't remember it. Tit. So Percival, I do not want to hear about your wand today. Maybe later. Oh, hello there. <laughs> and welcome. This story is told through the eyes of a doctor. Dr. Miles, what's he called? Benel and his uh, fucking bastard 
And what is the matter with me? I, I tell you what, I'm fucked. Oh, I can't do it. It may be hard to follow because it's taken out of context, but they're talking about them cunt, basically cunt. And I cannot do this. The idea of body snatching or a parasitic fucking bastard, a hidden, silent alien invasion using parasites in in the human fucking bastard. I, in, I no, I can't do it. 